Alrighty. Hello, thank you for joining me and welcome to part two of this Nutrition Simplified series. My name is Morgan Jenswald and I'm a Nutritional Sciences student at UW-Milwaukee. I graduate in May and I'm doing this series as part of an internship project. I'm excited about today's presentation because last time we touched on the foundations of nutrition, why we need food and what it does in our body. And today we are going to be looking more at the personal sides of nutrition. So I'm Morgan. Uh, some of you may, wa may have watched my first webinar, but just to reintroduce myself, I'm a nutritional sciences major. I'm a senior in the program, and I'm also our nutritional sciences club president. I have been a group exercise instructor and swim instructor for many years, so teaching is something that I'm very passionate about. And I also love to volunteer, exercise, cook, read, and watch movies with my husband. And there's a picture of us there. Uh, we just got married this past summer. So, hello. Tonight, my mission is threefold. I will define yo-yo dieting and why that can be a vicious cycle. I will explain a few popular diets. I think that it's important to understand that the media and nutrition literature is talking about in terms of diets, even if you aren't trying to follow one of them. And I'm also going to touch on intuitive eating, what that means and why that can be beneficial to learn more about. Let's get started. Let's get started with the question, what is diet culture? So diet culture is when individuals prioritize weight over well-being. I'm just sorry, I was just making sure my microphone was on. It we're good. <laughs> weight is one of the most important things to a lot of people, and it is what they equate a healthy lifestyle with. This can look like people discussing the new diet to lose weight, new exercise equipment, new fads, new supplements, new low calorie foods. Um, I am definitely guilty of this. When I first started studying nutrition, I would be kidding myself if I said that I didn't think there was a certain look to the word healthy. After years of not only studying food and the body, but working alongside lots of different people, I've realized healthy does not have a certain look. Just because somebody is thin doesn't mean they have healthful habits. And just because someone is larger in size doesn't mean they neglect their health. It's an exhausting world that we live in. One of eat this, not that, and lose inches fast, and meal replacements, and exercise equipment, and calorie counting. This never-ending cycle of that can cause us to constantly say, I'll start Monday, or I'll be good in the new year. I deserve this because I worked out today, or I haven't eaten anything. These thoughts can all be damaging and add to the idea that our self-worth comes from the size of our pants. If you haven't caught it yet, I don't love the idea of diet culture, um, and this presentation is kind of working to combat that idea. So I said that part of my mission was to define yo-yo dieting. What is that? It is a side effect of diet culture um, that is essentially weight cycling or the pattern of dieting, losing weight, and then gaining it back. This often occurs as a result of losing weight in some unsustainable way that can look like a quick fix or um, maybe even just a few months of doing something you wouldn't normally do. Not only can gaining weight and losing weight repeatedly have consequences for your health, uh, but it can also be discouraging. We'll touch more on how to prevent yo-yo dieting, but I'd like to go into detail about some of the fad diets you may hear advertised as ways to lose weight. So fad, do it, but di sorry. fad diets have always been a thing. Uh, they can contribute to major amounts of confusion. We talked about last time how um, the world of nutrition is always changing and can a lot of times be confusing. I think that sensational diets on tabloid headlines definitely add to that. So they can contribute to major amounts of confusion when it comes to the world of nutrition. I am not promoting any of these diets and I'm also not condemning them. If an individual should choose to follow a specific eating pattern, uh, then they should make sure that it is healthful and sustainable. I'm gonna use the word sustainable a lot tonight. The reason I would quicker tell someone to establish an eating pattern rather than a diet is because diets are temporary and eating patterns or healthy lifestyles are long-term. That's what we're looking for. Long-term healthy lifestyles can prevent yo-yo dieting. 
So in order to better equip you, I will explain some of these diets you have probably heard about. Each one has their own history, benefits, and risks. My goal, as always, is to simplify the word healthy for you all and help you to make informed choices for yourself. So in order to do that, I think it's important to have some general knowledge of these diets. All right, let's get into our first diet. So probably the most popular and controversial diet out there right now is the ketogenic diet. The keto diet was originally created by Russell Wilder back in 1920 as a way to treat epilepsy in kids. Uh, so it was definitely a very intense prescribed diet. Uh, the keto diet was original. Oh, sorry. Um, it helped epileptic patients by mimicking a fasting state without actually fasting. It wasn't until 2010 that it became a diet used for weight loss. The idea of this diet is to get the body into a state of nutritional ketosis, big word, by consuming an incredibly small amount of carbs, less than 50 grams a day. The idea is that the body will use up all of the stored glucose or glycogen in the body, which is what our body stores, stores carbs as, and starts burning fat for fuel. So if you can remember back uh, to the first presentation, we talked about how our body burns stored macronutrients for fuel. So the idea of this diet is that we burn fat instead of stored carbs. Um, you can see here that in the fourth box, the appropriate macronutrient daily ranges are far different than what I talked about a few weeks ago. So if you can remember, our body's favorite fuel source is carbohydrates. And last time we talked about how typically 45 to 65 percent of our daily calories are going to come from carbs. That's about half. Now with the ketogenic diet, um, this diet limits that to about one fifth of what is typically recommended. So this method has been showed to lead to weight loss. I am not denying that. So a lot of people have great results right off the bat. Um, and there are also benefits to this diet, including potentially lowering blood sugar and improving hormone imbalances. With any diet or eating pattern, our goal here is to make sure that it is sustainable. So to give you a sense of how few carbs you would need to eat in order to reach nutritional ketosis, which is that state where our body burns fat instead of carbs, take 20 grams. So 20 grams of carbs would be a half of a hamburger bun completely plain. So if you're trying to eat less than 50 carbs a day, then you're really not eating much more than half a hamburger bun plain. My concern with this diet is that it doesn't leave a lot of room for fruits and vegetables, which contain carbohydrates and many vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients our body needs to function. Last time we touched on the fact that we want to eat nutritionally dense foods in order to um, allow our body to work properly. And this diet, I worry, and a lot of other people worry too, uh, that we won't be able to eat as many nutritionally dense foods. So there are more risks than that. If an individual isn't paying attention to the type of fat they're consuming, they could end up eating a lot more saturated fat in order to get the proper amount of fat daily, which can raise one's cholesterol levels. As you can see, fat want, um, for the AMDRs for this diet, fat is supposed to take up 55 to 75% of your daily calories. Nutritional ketosis may not ever even be reached, and this much fat can be hard on your kidneys. Again, probably sounds like I'm leaning one way or the other, but I'm not telling you to try this diet or not try this diet. I'd just like you to be informed with the whole story um, and to weigh the risks, benefits, and restrictive nature of this diet, as well as the sustainability. Um, tonight's big picture is sustainability, so if you were to try this diet, how long could you actually do it for. All right. The next diet we are going to look at is paleo. So you've probably heard about this one. It was created by Walter Volton and popularized by a Dr. Boyd Eaton, who claimed that today's modern diet was the main cause of disease. The paleo diet is based off the ideas of hunting and gathering, uh, hence its name, paleo, which is short for paleolithic. Um, all foods consumed are actually pre-farming age foods. So that's meat, fruit, vegetables, seeds, but this eliminates grains and dairy. 
So the reason this diet, in my opinion, stacks up a little bit better against the keto diet is its emphasis on nutrient dense foods. Um, people often lose weight on this diet. That is true because they cut out high calorie processed foods or even higher calorie foods such as dairy or grain products. However, the research I've done in school and on my own does not permit me to say that all whole grains and dairy products or even all processed foods should be eliminated from our daily diet. As human be um, this is where a diet such as the paleo diet can get dangerous. As I was saying, as human beings, restriction can create an even greater need to quote unquote cheat or binge or fall off a certain way of eating. It's also important to remember, um, I'm not sure people think about this very often, but processed foods can be snack foods such as Oreos and potato chips, which I think we could all agree are a good thing to eat in moderation. But processed foods can also be convenience foods such as yogurt, frozen vegetables, canned beans and chickpeas, granola, dark chocolate, which I know are all a part of my everyday eating. If it is in a package, then it is probably considered processed. So to completely cut ourselves off from so many food groups can be challenging and can eventually turn one off from the idea of eating healthfully at all. If a nutrient-dense diet contains fruits and vegetables and also grains, dairy, and processed foods and is sustainable, I would argue that that is the better eating plan. I find diets fascinating. They are popularized eating plans taken from groups of people from history's ideals. Uh, they can be a great thing to study, which uh, we're doing tonight. And I think in order to come up with a way of eating that works for you as an individual, looking at different diets can be helpful. Just as I believe no two people's personalities or lifestyles, or even, you know, like what you like to watch on TV, what you enjoy in terms of exercise. No two people are exactly the same. I don't think two people's diets or ways of eating will be the exact same either. What you eat and how you eat should be a reflection of your upbringing, your own medical and nutritional needs, your activity levels, your home, and finally, what you like to eat. So it's good to stay up to date on trends in order to not get sucked into what is exactly the right way, because personally, I don't believe there is one right way. And I'm sure that coming onto this presentation thinking, okay, nutrition simplified, you know, I'm going to be given five foods. This is what I should eat. Um, I just, I truly don't think that that is going to be a sustainable way of living healthfully because nobody wants to be told five things to eat. So I believe we are to eat nutritionally dense foods as well as foods that we enjoy. And I believe we can be creative in how we cook and dine and snack. Of course, there are lots more diets out there, uh, such as a few that I've mentioned, the Mediterranean, Atkins, Dash, Raw, Whole30, etc. There are a lot of diets out there. And if you would like to explore uh, them on your own, feel free. I would definitely suggest going to eatright.org to do some reading. So that is the website uh, that is from the Academy of Dietetics. And I would say that that is definitely the most credible nutrition information out there. Um, I also mentioned in my second bullet point, I don't know if you find this interesting or not, but some advice that I like to abide by. So the principles I use aren't necessarily just taken from fad diets, but they can be considered in line. So my goal in talking about diets is to free you from the thinking that there is only one way to eat. As you can see, I like to pick and choose um, kind of what I like from a few different diets. Uh, you could also say that I wasn't even taking those from any diets, but that they just come um, along those lines. All right, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about in terms of fad diets tonight. Please reach out to me if you want any resources on other diets, um, but moving forward. So part of my mission was to talk about eating for life. This means finding a sustainable way to eat and live healthfully. I want you to think about what the sentence, I'm on a diet, means to you. Does it make you wince? Do you immediately feel restricted, hungry? I'd love for all of us to be able to eat healthfully 
and for life without confining ourselves to the I'm on a diet mentality. Intuitive eating, you may have heard of this before, you may have not, is a practice that originated with two dietitians by the name of Evelyn Triboli and Elise Reich, whose, philo whose philosophies embrace developing body positivity and reconnecting with one's internal wisdom about eating. I just love that, internal wisdom. So we all have the capability of making food choices on our own and nourishing our body properly, um, eating until we're full, eating until we're satisfied. That's another part of it. Um, and so their approach is just kind of trying to get back to that internal wisdom. So my favorite way to think about intuitive eating is to look at the three-year-old that I nanny. So when Molly's tummy is hungry, she asks for breakfast or a snack or lunch. Maybe you guys have some kids in your life that you can kind of um, relate to me on this. Um, so when Molly's tummy is full, she simply stops eating. This could mean she leaves half an apple slice or even one bite of a delicious cookie. Sometimes I look at her and I'm like, really, you can't finish that one bite? But if Molly's body doesn't feel the need to eat any longer, she'll simply stop. Kids rarely eat emotionally or even because it is in front of them. They don't beat themselves up about the donuts in the break room or overthink a slice of pizza they had at dinner. They eat food and they understand to an extent what is healthy for their body and what is considered a treat. Eating for kids is simply, well, simple. For us adults, eating can be trickier. I haven't read the book Intuitive Eating yet, but I have done a lot of reading on it. And the next slide talks about the major principles of intuitive eating, which I find fascinating. So you can kind of take a minute um, and look at these 10 points. These are taken right from intuitiveeating.org, which is an awesome resource. And I would definitely suggest that you go there and browse it if this is something that's interesting to you. So I'm not going to say that intuitive eating is the way to live life, um, but I do, however, think that adopting some of these skills and approaches can help us combat the constant struggle that is yo-yo dieting. So my mission is to simplify the word healthy for people, as always, and there's nothing simple about constantly looking for the newest and best way to lose weight quickly and then becoming discouraged when that doesn't work, only to do it all over again. The intuitive eating approach is essentially throwing out the rigorous diets and the urge to try the next best thing and to, I'm paraphrasing here, definitely, uh, just simply live life, eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full. I won't go into what each of these boxes mean, uh, but I'll touch on a few. So the second box, honor your hunger, I definitely totally can relate to this one. I don't know about y'all. But it means that once you are ravenous, all intentions of moderation just go out the window. So basically what this box is saying is to listen to your body, eat when you're hungry, and then that is all in order to try to prevent overeating. So when you get home from work, if you know that dinner isn't for a few hours, I would strongly suggest not starving yourself until dinner in order uh, to prevent, you know, eating just far more than makes you comfortable at dinner time. Um, I believe number eight is respect your body. Um, I also find this one super important. It's really hard to reject the diet mentality, which is the first thing we talked about tonight. If you are overly critical of your body size and shape. Um, this is definitely easier said than done, but if body image is something that you struggle with, please reach out to me and I can try to help you find resources that might help with this. Um, in simplest, simplest terms, I know that we could do a million webinars on this and that wouldn't even scratch the surface um, of body positivity, but I think we would all do ourselves a favor by showing our body a little more love. Um, and then the last one, I really just think this is a great reminder. You do not have to eat perfectly in order to be healthy. So I've never heard the term gentle nutrition before, um, but I, I think that it encompasses this idea really well. Nutrient deficiency or unhealthiness does not come from one snack or meal or day of eating. This next phrase is taken right from intuitiveeating.org. Progress, not perfection, is what counts. And progress does not mean, you know, your progress pictures in the bathroom meal 
mirror of you flexing your biceps. I'm talking about the progress in order to obtain comfortability with your healthy lifestyle. If any of this is interesting to you, uh, you can definitely go to intuitiveeating.org. I feel like I've said that about five times now, but read what the professionals over there practice and preach. I find it super interesting and I've enjoyed thinking about what these phrases mean and how I can implement them into my life. All right, I feel like that went by super quickly, um, but that's probably never a bad thing when you're listening to a webinar. So I'm just gonna wrap things up um, in summary. This is what we've learned tonight. So diet culture, it is the act of prioritizing weight over well-being. This idea has definitely been instilled in probably all of us for years. And it's going to take a lot more than this presentation to get ourselves out of that mindset. However, I think that addressing that, addressing the fact that it is a real thing um, is a very helpful first step. Second, we talked about yo-yo dieting what that is, and the idea that a healthful, sustainable lifestyle can help combat the ups and downs of dieting. We touched on a few popular fad diets, um, primarily ketogenic and paleo. Um, they may all claim to be the right way to eat. Um, and especially, you know, moving forward into more diets than even those. But if you take away one thing from today, my hope is that you know that there is no one way to eat. Finally, we talked briefly on intuitive eating, uh, which is a method people use to eat for life. So finding a way to live healthfully without thinking about it constantly is liberating. My hope is that we can all allow food to be a part of our life without controlling our life. It's really exciting, the idea of finding a way to be healthy versions of ourselves without losing ourselves. So this presentation may have felt a little bit abstract, um, I definitely touched on maybe like four ideals that uh, don't seem super concrete. But what the exciting part is that the next presentation, um, I will be doing my most practical advice yet. So I plan on sharing tips, tricks, experiences, recipes, lifestyle hacks, important resources, and a few philosophies that I found helpful. So as always, my goal is to simplify the word healthy um, and give you all the tools you need in order to be that for yourself. So I will at this time ask if there are any questions. Um, if not, I will definitely be sending out these slides. Um, and then this presentation, I believe, will end up on our YouTube page, just like the first one. And so if you missed the first one, you can definitely check that out as well.